Little Miss Gnome is here again. And I'm here this time to talk to you about solids. So, I thought it was only fear. We talked about gases. And gases are chaos. They're giggling and jiggling and wheeling all over. Because they don't have very many intermolecular forces. They're just so chaotic, there's no chance for attraction. So that was the element of fear. Expansive. Then we talked about liquids and fluidity. So liquids have intermolecular forces. They're being attracted to each other, but they're still flowing. They're moving around, and so we can move around in them. We can even sometimes, if we keep moving, depending on how strong those intermolecular forces are, you could possibly dance on it. That's the non-Newtonian fluids. And then there's solids. So solids have intermolecular forces and they're held together in a regular pattern. And they're really not moving. There might occasionally be a giggle or a wiggle. Very serene. It's very hard to be that way in meditation. There's always a little bit of giggles. You should always have giggles in meditation of joy. So there's different types of solids and solids do have intermolecular forces and beyond. So we're gonna go through the different types uh, they're talked about in your lab and then the gnomes did an experiment and they left you the data and you're going to classify them and then perhaps you can play with some non-newtonian fluids all right before we begin our affirmation of the earth element solid fully supported by the earth i step forward in life safe and secure in chemistry, we should say, I step forward in this chemistry class. All right, so let's actually start with ionic because we're pretty familiar with those. And you know ionic, you can recognize them on a piece of paper if I give you the formula because they're going to be a metal and a non-metal. And the attraction, yeah, the key word here is attraction. They're attracted. Um, so these guys have attractions. Called IMFs. And so they have the ionic one. We have our cation positive and our anion negative. And so we have an attraction, which we show with dots. Okay, I also kind of encompassed the molecular, polar, nonpolar, because they also have attractions between themselves. Polars, there were two types we talked about. We have the dipole attraction, so the IMF. So just to clarify, polar and nonpolar is a category of the molecule. The IMF is called a dipole or an extreme dipole is an H bond. Maybe we should show this with dots. Nonpolar, their IMF were in London. They were pretty weak. But you have that momentary dispersion. Ionic was the strongest type of IMF. And so we have a new category up here, and they're macromolecular. They're the gemstones that a lot of us like to wear sometimes. Um, or graphite, diamonds are one of the best examples there. Um, so if you have a gemstone that's silicon dioxide, um, which mine is, and there's impurities in it, but quartz crystal would be a great example. Or diamond, what's the example we used here? I used a diamond. So macromolecular is all covalent bonds. There's no IMFs. So these guys, this is like your body. It's not going to come apart. You're not going to crack a diamond in half by hammering it. So in the lab, when the diamond was given to that gnome, nothing happened. It's not going to have any solubility. Maybe we should put frowny faces. Nothing. Not soluble. It's not going to melt. And it's not going to conduct. 
because it's all held together in one beautiful network. And that's why we can make these beautiful crystals with them and then wear them. And they have different properties. All right, Ionic. So what we've been doing is you guys could look on paper and say, okay, this is ionic or this is molecular, right? We have metal and non-metal or we have only non-metals. This, this is like beyond everything we talked about. These are very special. So again, a diamond is all carbons and every carbon in that diamond, if you have a diamond that you wear, every carbon, it's only made up of carbon. Every carbon is covalently hooked up to another carbon. Again, like your shoulder, there's no dots. Now, on paper, you could tell the difference. You could look at something and say, oh, it's ionic. Oh, it's polar. Oh, it's nonpolar. It's a dipole. It's a London. It's an H-bond. What we're doing now is the gnomes are in lab playing. And we're going to look at some of the properties that these would have. Now, again, if there's no attractive forces, it's completely one ginormous molecule like a diamond or silicon dioxide, so quartz crystal, then nothing's going to happen in lab. All right, so ionic. You could use sodium chloride, table salt, do potassium iodide. The big characteristic that tells you it's ionic is it's water soluble. Woohoo! It is water soluble. Ionic ones then do something very special in water. They conduct. So let's go over to this place. They conduct in solution. In solution means they don't conduct by themselves. If you try to put a conductivity meter to the sodium chloride in your salt shaker, nothing's going to happen. Because as a solid, the ions are stuck. It's once we put them in water, the ions are meandering around like ions like to do. We call that aqueous. They conduct, ionics conduct, once you put them in water. And this, maybe we should put, we'll put a special star with that one, because that is what makes it. That is the characteristic. If something conducts, once it's dissolved in water, it is ionic. It's the characteristic that tells us in a lab that we're dealing with ionic. All right, now, something else dissolves in water. Water is polar, and polar likes polar. Mama polar bear has baby polar bears, and they love their mama. So polar loves polar, and water is polar. So the polar molecular is also water soluble. But how can the gnomes, my good friends, my partners, my comrades, my brothers and sisters and cousins, aunts and uncles, know that it's not ionic? It doesn't conduct. So we'll put a frown, it's non-conductive. And the reason for that is even though it dissolved in the water, the water doesn't pull it apart the bonds. It pulls apart the attraction between the molecules, but you still have molecules in the water. All right, there is one exception to that. I'm gonna mention it and that's acids, because the water can pull the acids apart. But we're not gonna deal with that in this lab, because acids aren't solids. They're always gonna be a liquid or a gas. So we don't have to worry about it for this lab. All right, what about the nonpolar? Well, in class, the way we know something was nonpolar is it was made up of carbons and hydrogens only. That's a big take home message. So now we as gnomes have special glasses we can put on and we can look at the molecules in the test tube and say, oh, that's only carbons, hydrogens. There's no oxygens. But you guys are humans. And when you look at the test tube, you see a solid there. So you don't know what it's made up of. All right. What's going to happen is these that are non-polar, they don't like the mama polar bear. They are water insoluble.
They don't dissolve in the water. However, we get to do a happy face under solubility. If you read all those words in the lab, some of you like to read, they are soluble when they're not a polar bear. When they're a grizzly bear, they are soluble in nonpolar. Something made out of carbons and hydrogens, which is xylene. C8H10. So in the lab, this is pretty stinky. And so the gnomes wear paper, I'm sorry, clothes pins over their nose so they don't have to smell the xylene. Mothballs, yeah, nonpolar tend to be pretty stinky. Now, this is a characteristic. Only nonpolar are soluble in xylene. Nothing else is. In fact, the gnomes know something that's really helpful. You're never going to be soluble in both. Well, okay, there's no never ever. If you take organic chemistry, Chem 105, you'll get to learn there are things called emulsifiers that can be soluble in both. And many of you like chocolate. So chocolate's made up of sugar, which is very polar, and fat, which is nonpolar. And so we have an emulsifier, which allows the two to mix. All right, in your body, you have emulsifiers too. Let's talk about, oh, yeah. So we wouldn't have to do, this is the, Nonpolar soluble. No, no. Nope. Melting point. Well, in the lab, I'm having trouble with my knock today. In the lab, um, the gnomes use Bunsen burners, and they had to be very careful because these knops get in the way. Ionic has a pretty strong attraction. So this is going to be, depending on the strength of the attraction, this is going to have a medium to high melting point. Meaning it's going to take one to three minutes to melt. Macromolecular, you can heat it as long as you want with a Bunsen burner. Nothing's going to happen. Now, Dipoles, even H-bonds, they're strong, but they're not that strong. These guys melt pretty fast, usually in a moment, but you put near the Bunsen burner and they melt. So that's why that's important, this lab, because intermolecular forces, yes, they hold things together, but we just have to heat them a little bit, give them a little bit of jiggles, and they come apart. Ionic intermolecular force is much stronger. We need a lot more jiggles. And then a covalent bond, we're not going to break that with jiggles and giggles. We need something that's going to cut it. A chainsaw, an enzyme, a chemical reaction. All right. And then conductivity. Nope. We're not going to do it even for the nonpolars or you can put a frowny face. There is one solid that does conduct as a solid. And that was the one at the bottom of our list, the metallic. And you know metals, copper, zinc, aluminum, they conduct as a solid. And this is their distinguishing characteristic. So, can read what I wrote about it. The metals, their electrons are actually loosely held, and so their electrons can move between atoms. They flow. They're the only ones that can do that. Remember that plum pudding model? It's kind of like that. Um, and so because of that, if something conducts as a solid, it's automatically a metal. They have different melting points. Oh, they are definitely not soluble. Let's just give them brownies here. But their melting points are variable, kind of like the ionic. All right, let's review that really quick. Metals conduct as a solid. Ones, 
something else conducts. And that is ions. Ions conduct, but not as a solid. They conduct in solution. Distinguishing thing for each. Solubility, only two are water soluble. That was ionic and polar molecular. Because as long as you have a distribution of charge like they do, they love water. Distinguishing there conducts or doesn't conduct. The other thing that distinguishes is the polars do melt right away. The ionic will melt, but you have to be patient and you have to have a good Bunsen burner and you have to know how to adjust it. Distinguishing for nonpolar, they're the only ones that will dissolve in xylene, but the xylene's stinky. So we usually only test something that doesn't dissolve in the water. So if something dissolves in water, it cannot dissolve in xylene. It can never, ever be both. All right. I think that's all I had for today. Imagine that. Many blessings. Have a beautiful day. I'm going to go on a bike ride. It is. Bye-bye.